You know, for a long time I've been trying to switch gears to a non-political direction for this channel, and then I realized, you know, the real answer is not to not cover politics, but to cover them uh, in a different way. And I want to make a series of videos, possibly. This is probably going to be one or two videos. But a series of videos on how to... Um, what the alternative would be to alt-rightism, okay? So, what the alt-right is, is a sort of knee-jerk reaction to decades upon decades upon decades, about a hundred years, of what's called cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism is real, even though it's considered a conspiracy theory. It was a real theory created by a real guy and it was utilized in both the Frankfurt School and the Frankfurt School's second incarnation called the New School in, you know, the United States. So the Frankfurt School being in Germany, it was kicked out of Germany when a certain regime took control in Germany and kicked them out. So then they were invited into the United States where they established the New School and Bada bing, bada boom, you get this. So the United States has successfully confronted Marxist attempts to derail it from its historic path of liberty and order. The multifaceted effort to defeat the enemy, generally referred to as the Cold War, uh, concentrated mainly uh, uh, concentrated many of the best minds in the country. Uh, one of the problems that you see with this is I agree with McCarthy in the sense that we spent a lot of time fighting communists overseas, but not a lot of time fighting the communists in this country that had infiltrated the education system, that had infiltrated many levels of government, including the State Department. It's very interesting that uh, everything McCarthy had theorized would happen seems to have happened. So in 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolved, Many Americans and others around the globe justifiably believe that communism had been defeated. However, American Marxists making use of the complacency of that victory. Now, I want to make something clear. I'm going to stop here for a second. People may see that I make videos about Stalin, positive videos about Stalin, positive videos about Lenin, etc. Now, what you need to understand, what I discovered in researching uh, things like Leninism, Stalinism, uh, Juchi, Maoism, the cultural Marxism that is practiced in the United States is defective communism. And it's made defective on purpose to weaken our country. You understand? So, uh, if you watch a video by Yuri Brezhmanov or whatever his name is, it's very telling as to uh, what the goals of cultural Marxism are. See, the goals of communism in the Soviet Union and elsewhere is to work. <laughs> it's to build a society that works. What the goal of cultural Marxism is, is to build a society that works against itself. So, cultural Marxism is in many ways the opposite of communism, in the sense that Soviet communism, or Juchi, or Maoism, the goals of these, though imperfect, is to create a society that works toward functioning as a whole, similar to Mussolini fascism, National Socialism, uh, Peronism or Justicialism, etc. Whereas the goal of cultural Marxism is the direct opposite. It's to create a society that works against itself by putting different groups against each other. So, the cultural Marxists would cloak their goals under the pretense of social justice. They now seek to dismantle the foundations of the American Republic by rewriting history, uh, reintroducing racism, creating privileged classes, and determining what can be said in public discourse, the military and houses of worship. Unless Marxist thought is defeated again, today's cultural Marxists will achieve what the Soviet Union never could, 
the subjugation of the United States to a totalitarian, soul-destroying ideology. Now, what you have to understand with this, a lot of people will say <clears throat> that the Soviet Union was defeated. The Soviet Union was not defeated so much as the Soviet Union became defunct. The people of the Soviet Union wanted specific rights and things of that nature that they didn't have under the Soviet Union. And because of that, it became defunct. Uh, and so what you're seeing with the United States is the United States is succumbing not to the people's urge for rights, but cultural Marxists pushing and, and, and prodding one group against another. So with the end of the Cold War, many America, this is just re reiterating, so the, the, let's, the key takeaways. End of Cold War, people thought communism was defeated. Cultural Marxists have cloaked their crap in social justice. Uh, unless Marxist ideas are defeated, their proponents will push the United States to follow a totalitarian ideology that obliterates freedom and opportunity. So, the alt-right is a knee-jerk reaction to this. Okay? That's what it is. Now, what's an alternative to the alt-right? Well, I plan on showing that. Now, I'm not going to watch this for the full 57 minutes and 34 seconds, but Antonio Gramsci was an Italian cultural Marxist that was thrown out of Italy, and he took residence in the United States. And it is interesting, uh, you should watch this, but he is the architect of the Long March. So if you want an alternative to the alt-right and an alternative to cultural Marxism, you need to accept the fact, it's like getting fat, okay? Cultural Marxism is like getting fat. So, this destruction of the United States social, uh, social, social culture, political, uh, religious, etc., all these structures, this happened over time, okay? This didn't happen in one day. It took a while for this to creep into things and start uh, taking effect. Uh, now... You can remember, if you're my age, when this stuff started becoming very noticeable in the schools and things like that, where education was no longer about education and started being about feelings and the importance of multiculturalism, diversity, uh, blah, 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 blah. Nothing was objective anymore. Uh, and I, I see that as taking effect, I would say, in the uh, mid to late 90s, probably 1995, 1996 as when the education system starkly changed. There was not even a pretense of objectivism anymore. But you guys can watch this on your own. I encourage you to. So I'm going to move forward. Now, this is a, a biography of James Mason. I want to make sure that people understand what I am covering here. This is for educational purposes only. I want people to keep in mind that this video is about creating an alternative to extremism, an alternative to the alt-right, and not to promote extremism or to promote the alt-right. I am very much against extremism. Okay, so James Nolan Mason is an American uh, National Socialist uh, and an ideologue for the Adam Waffen Division, a uh, National Socialist organization, after growing disillusioned with the mass movement approach to National Socialism movements, he became advocating for a white uh, revolution through uh, means. He was referred to as the godfather of fascist um, alternative means. Uh, 
Uh, in the Fair Observer, he has been convicted of assault and weapons charges, as well as charged with sexual exploitation and, and possession of pornographic images of a minor. In 2021, Mason is one of, of only two individuals sanctioned by the Canadian government on its list of terror-related entities. I'm sure the other one is Evalion or Veronica Bouchard. Because, you know, nobody is more dangerous than a tiny little girl. So his nationality is American. He was born on the 25th of July, 1952. He is 70 years old. Uh, okay, his early life. This is important because this is the... Uh, he's somebody that was born a certain way. Okay, which is very interesting to me. He's obviously born a certain way. He's a, he thinks differently than most. Okay, and a positive influence in his life as a gentleman that uh, I think was a positive influence in many people's lives. And uh, so Mason grew up in uh, Chile, Coeth, Ohio in, uh, in Siege, his book. He recounted having been interested in politics at a young age, describing how his father once took him to a Richard Nixon rally in 1960. He would continue to support mainstream conservative politicians like Barry Goldwater and eventually uh, populist ones like George Wallace. Sometime after supporting the latter, Mason would describe this as the last instance of himself supporting mainstream political parties. In 1966, when he was 14 years old, he joined the youth movement of George Lincoln Rockwell's ANP. In uh, 1968, when he was 16, Mason planned to uh, dispatch <laughs> the principal and other staff members at his high school. Now, thankfully, somebody that worked for the ANP, the physics professor, Dr. William Luther Pierce stepped in and told him, you know, why don't you stop, stop going to school and come work for us, okay? After the assassination of Mr. Rockwell in 1967, Mason aligned himself with the, uh, the National Socialist White People's Party and Joseph Tomasi's National Socialist Liberation Front. In 1970, at the age of 18, Mason became a full-fledged full member of the National Socialist White People's Party and returned to, uh, now keep in mind, George Lincoln Rockwell, I believe, is the one that originally changed the name of the ANP to the National Socialist White People's Party. So, in the early 1980s, Mason began corresponding with Sandra Good and Lynette Fromm, two followers of Charles Manson, in 1982, along with Manson, Mason founded Universal Order. Universal Order is a concept that Charles Manson, I really do suggest people educate themselves on the concepts that Charles Manson talks about. He is, his philosophy is extremely interesting, but the concept of Manson is not unlike that of Mussolini or other people that want a universal order where every, every person has a place. Criminal charges and convictions. In 1973, Mason and fellow uh, National Socialist Greg Hurley's deployed tear gas against several uh, black teenagers in the parking lot of a Dairy Queen. Mason was convicted of assault and sentenced to six months in a Cincinnati workhouse. In 1988 and 1991, police raided Mason's home in Ohio and seized pornographic photos of a 15-year-old girl. In 1992, he pleaded guilty to two counts of illegal use of a minor in nudity-oriented material, for which he was sentenced uh, to a $500 fine and a suspended sentence. In May 1994, Mason was arrested and charged with two counts of sexual exploitation of a minor and two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Manson threatened his ex-girlfriend, who was then 16 years old, and a Latino man whom she had been dating with a firearm. Mason struck a plea bargain 
and was convicted of weapons charges, for which he was sentenced to three years of incarceration before being released in August 1999. Now, people might go, well, this guy sounds like a bad gentleman, uh, whatever. You know, people change. The, 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 ma the, the, the uh, Mason that I saw on the newer Bob Larson episode uh, didn't seem like the Mason that was on the episode in the early 90s. He seems like a changed person. Uh, he seems like he has uh, changed quite a bit and matured quite a bit. Adam, Adam Waffen Division. Uh, Mason's writings in Siege and the Siege newsletter, which have been compiled into a book, have been credited with forming a large part of the Adam Waffen Division's ideological foundation. In an interview with Frontline, Mason claimed uh, he was approached by members of the Adam Waffen uh, Division who wished to recruit him as an ideological advisor to which he obliged. He asserts that he has no role in orchestrating plots connected to the group, but simultaneously refuses to condemn attacks linked to them. Now, you gotta watch how you say that because a lot of people, a lot of liberals, people like me have said for a long time, why don't the good Muslims condemn the bad Muslims? Okay, they don't. Most of the time they don't. It's very rare that you see that. And why aren't the good gay people chastising the gay people that are promoting uh, child abuse? Okay? You don't see that frequently either, although you, you do. Some of them actually have recently come out uh, to speak their minds about this disturbing, uh, these disturbing sex parades. Okay? In an interview with MSNBC that members have often disclosed to him their intentions to commit acts of violence, including Sam Woodward, who was later charged with uh, the murder of Blaze Bernstein. Okay. Uh, that's a name? I well, guess it is. On March 14th, 2020, Mason claimed that the Adam Waffen division had disbanded. However... The group was believed to be on the cusp of being designated a foreign terrorist organization by the State Department and the Anti-Defamation League. Now, I've covered the Anti-Defamation League and showed that the Anti-Defamation League is a disinformation, basically a disinformation propaganda machine that generates fake news and fake they, they, they seem to focus conveniently only on certain groups while ignoring others. But this was concluded, the move is designed to give members breathing room, blah, 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 political views. Mason believes that national socialists cannot take power as long as the existing government remains in place, yada, yada, yada. So Mason's writings are considered influential among radical right. We'll see this again. Radical right wing. National socialism is not right wing. National socialism is extreme centrism. It takes from both. In 1980, Mason took over writing Siege, the newsletter of the National Socialist Liberation Front. He continued publishing until 1986 in the newsletter Mason paid tribute to the Big H, Joseph Tomasi, Charles Manson, and Savitra Devi, and advocated uh, bad stuff to de destabilize society. Now, this is the thing. What you see here is you see somebody that has become so disaffected by society and so disaffected by the inaction of society against the destructive forces of cultural Marxism that they see nothing but to behave as a similar type of person. So he was designated as a terrorist by Canada. Who gives a crap? Who gives a crap? Now, Dr. William Luther Pierce is one of... Uh, I think one of the most 
prolific uh, and most influential and um, deep, deep thinkers philosophically. Um, he's the one that actually turned me on to Baruch Spinoza. Uh, Baruch Spinoza is somebody, if you ever listen to Dr. Pierce's lecture, uh, Cosmotheism, The Wave of the Future, it mentions uh, Baruch Spinoza as the originator of many of the ideas of cosmotheism. Uh, and it's very interesting. And, and he states, you know, you know people, people have these ideas that everybody's so closed-minded that belongs to these, these ideological bents. It's not true. I think the people that you're going to find are the most closed-minded are not the people. Now, Dr. Pierce was of the intellectual elite. Uh, of regular society. This is a gentleman that worked for Los Alamos, worked for JPL, uh, s taught physics for Caltech, for goodness sakes. Uh, this is not a foolish gentleman. He was a member of the intellectual elite. Uh, what led him to realize that something had to be done is that, well, you can, you can go on bit shoot and find that out. I, I got to watch what I say here. But Dr. Pierce is unfortunately somebody that I think went to his wit's end as well. But he did try to be creative and he tried to create a society, a, a sort of a, a commune, if you will, in uh, Hillsboro, West Virginia. So Dr. Pierce was a physicist by, a pro by profession. He was the author of the novels The Turner Diaries and Hunter under the pen name Andrew MacDonald. The former has inspired multiple, uh, supposedly inspired multiple hate attacks. What it is, is they found the book uh, in the possession of these people. Now, how many people own a Bible? How many people own a Bible that have committed horrific crimes? Does that mean that the Bible was the inspiration for every crime that everyone that has owned a Bible has ever committed? I don't think so. Pierce founded the, uh, the white group, uh, National Alliance. Now, he considered it a white separatist organization, not a white nationalist organization. Uh, he led it for almost 30 years. He was born uh, William Luther Pierce III on September 11th, 1933 in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he died on July 23rd, 2002 aged uh, 68 at Mill Point, West Virginia. Other names, uh, Andrew MacDonald, Education, Allen Military Academy, Alma Mater, Rice University, University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, so, professor of uh, physics at Oregon State University, researcher at, the, uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratories, researcher at Caltech. I'm sorry, he taught at Oregon State. That's interesting because Linus Pauling also taught at Oregon State. Linus Pauling is another person I'm greatly influenced by. I, I think Linus Pauling is a brilliant man also. People should learn everything they can about Linus Pauling as well. So uh, he was a researcher at Los Alamos National Laboratories at Caltech and at the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. He was a research assistant at, uh, somewhere in Colorado. Uh, he was, his organization was known as the National Alliance. It still exists to this day. People can check that out. Uh, these are the movements that he's known for. So he, was, he had two children. He was born at Atlanta to a Presbyterian family of Scotch-Irish and English descent. Pierce was a descendant of Thomas H. Watts, the governor of Alabama, and the attorney general of the Confederate States of America during the American Civil War. Pierce graduated from high school in 1952, and he went on to receive a bachelor's degree in physics from Rice University in 1955, as well as a doctorate from the University of Colorado at Boulder. In 1962, he became an assistant professor of physics at the Oregon State University. In that year, in 19 
1965, he left his tenure at Oregon State University and became a senior researcher for the aerospace manufacturer Pratt & Whitney in Connecticut. In 1966, Pierce moved to Washington, D.C. area and became an associate of George Lincoln Rockwell, founder of the ANP, who was assassinated in 1967. Okay, Pierce became co-leader of the National Youth Alliance, which split in 1974, with Pierce founding the National Alliance. So, Pierce's novel, The Turner Diaries, depicts a violent revolution in the United States, followed by a world war. Now, remember, this is a fictional book, and the extermination of people. Uh, another novel by Pierce Hunter portrays the action of a lone wolf. Uh, in 1985, Pierce relocated the headquarters of the National Alliance to Hillsboro, West Virginia, where he founded the Cosmotheist Community Church. Uh, to receive tax exemption for his organization, Pierce spent the rest of his life in West Virginia. So let's take a look. First, I'm going to take a look at his life and career. Then we're going to go back up to the Cosmotheist Community Church. So early life and education, William Luther Pierce III was born in Atlanta, Georgia, the son of William Luther Pierce Jr. and Margaret Farrell. Uh, his Presbyterian family of Scotch, Irish, and English descent, Pierce's younger brother, Florinoy Sanders, an engineer, uh, assisted Pierce in his political activities. His father, was born uh, in Christiansburg, Virginia in 1892. His mother was born in uh, Richland, Georgia in 1910 with her family being part of the aristocracy of the Old South. Uh, descendants of Thomas H. Watts, the governor of Alabama and attorney general of the Confederate States of America. After the American Civil War, the family living, uh, lived a working class existence. Pierce's father once served as a government representative and ocean going on ocean going cargo ships and sent reports back to Washington, D.C. He later became a manager of an insurance company, but was killed in a car accident in 1943. After the elder Pierce's death, the family moved to Montgomery, Alabama, and after that to Dallas, Texas. Pierce performed well in school. His last two years in high school were spent at the Allen Military Academy in Bryan, Texas. As a teenager, his hobbies and interests were model rocketry, chemistry, radios, electronics. Now notice these are actually these are hobbies extremely similar to another person that's been of great interest to me and that would be of course um, Jack Parsons, John, Jack Parsons or John Parsons or Marvel Whiteside Parsons or whatever, the guy that founded JPL. Okay. Early political activities, his tenure as assistant professor at Oregon State University coincided with the rise of the civil rights movement and later the counterculture, uh, which is cultural Marxism. Let's call these things what they are. The civil rights movement and the counterculture revolution were funded by the Soviet Union and Cuba. We know that. The former, along with the protests against the Vietnam War, he regarded as being led by certain people. In 1965, to finance his political ambitions, Pierce left his tenure at Oregon State University and relocated to North Haven, uh, Connecticut, to work as a senior researcher at the Advanced Materials Research and Development Laboratory of the aerospace manufacturer Pratt & Whitney. After a brief membership in the anti-communist John Birch Society in 1962, he resigned because the society was uninvolved in racial issues. After he moved to Washington, D.C., he became an associate of Mr. Rockwell, founder of the ANP. During that time, he was the editor of the party's quarterly ideological journal, National Socialist World. When Rockwell was murdered in 1967, Pierce became one of the leading members of the National Socialist White People's Party, the successor to the ANP. In 1968, Pierce left the National Socialist White People's Party and joined Youth for Wallace, meaning he supported George Wallace, who was a segregationist Democrat, if I remember correctly. Let me make certain of that real quick here. 
So yes, Mr. Wallace here, Mr. Wallace, George uh, George Wallace. Uh, yes, it does state here that he is a Democrat. He's one of them Dixiecrats. Uh, political party Democratic, other political parties, American Independent Party. So yes, he was a Southern Democrat. Uh, he was anti-segregationist, of course. So seg this is he's famous for saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. The National Alliance was organized in 1974. Pierce intended the organization to be a political vanguard that would ultimately bring about uh, the United States becoming the way that Pierce wanted it to become. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the Cosmo Theist Community Church. So... In the 1970s, Pierce created the religious philosophy of cosmotheism, based on a mixture of German romanticism, the Darwinian concept of natural selection, and Pierce's interpretation of George Bernard Shaw's play, Man and Superman. I like how they completely leave out the fact that Pierce credited Baruch Spinoza uh, with, <laughs> with the concepts of cosmotheism, because... Heaven forbid if Pierce gave credit to a Jewish man, which, by the way, Baruch Spinoza was not actually Jewish. Baruch Spinoza was a Jew that was uh, excommunicated from the Jewish community due to his beliefs. Now, what's funny is Baruch Spinoza proved, Baruch Spinoza is the reason I believe in God. I believe that Mr. Spinoza's proof of God is irrefutable. Okay, uh, it just it makes plenty of sense uh, from a scientific and a materialistic standpoint, and I encourage people to read the Ethics by Baruch Spinoza. So the works he wrote as Dr. Pierce are who who we are, uh, Cosmotheism, Divine Aryan Consciousness, from Man to Superman. So Mr. Strom here, Kevin Alfred Strom, he is the current head of the National Alliance, so you're aware. This is an article about his son, Kelvin Pierce. It's mainly a whiny, sappy, blah, blah, blah about how his daddy emotionally abused him. Now, Kelvin Pierce also, as far as I know, proving that genetics is 85% or higher uh, genetic, you know, IQ is over 85% genetic, Kelvin Pierce, I believe, was also a national uh, uh, NASA researcher and rocket uh, engineer. But people have the ability to read this on their own. I don't feel like going over it. it it's like a sappy nonsense about how daddy was emotionally abused. Everybody was emotionally abused. It's the way people raised kids back then, for God's sake. So people might wonder, where is this reaction coming from? Well, with cultural Marxism pushing the type of anti-white hatred that it does, and it does, and by cultural Marxism, I mean the intellectual elites, uh, the, well, not really, they're not very intelligent, but I should say the academic elites that might not be that intelligent, but are the ones pulling the strings of academia, uh, are promoting concepts like uh, critical race theory, uh, aggressive feminism, these things. And it's caused, uh, and also the, the open borders and the DACA nonsense and all that. And what it's caused is it's caused an influx of new immigrants from Asia and Latin America. Now, I have my own view with Latin Americans. I think that Latin Americans, the United States has always had a healthy dose of Latin Americans in this country ever since we conquered the territories that we conquered from Mexico off of Mexico. Okay, uh, Colorado, what was it, Colorado, California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, I think I got them all, Utah maybe, I don't know. But the point that I'm making here is there have always been a considerable amount of Latin Americans in this country of a high indigenous uh, bloodline, and I don't see anything wrong with them being in this country. Uh, I don't, I, we, we've had naturalized uh, Latin Americans in this country. They have been part of this country. Uh, I believe in a Pan-American, people know my views 
on the concept of a cosmic race, I think people need to read the works of Jose Vasconcelos, The Cosmic Race, to understand where I'm coming from with that. Uh, and uh, that's important. Now, what you need to understand, descriptions and projections of... So, why did I even bother with that? Well, because... Other people are not too crazy about the high influx of Asian and Latin Americans coming into the country, but it's not just Asians and Latin Americans. Where I live, we have had a huge influx of Africans and Haitians, and with the lack of any desire to naturalize anybody, there's no desire to encourage people to learn English. Like, for example, my mother's family that were... Um, Italian, they claim to be Italian from Brazil, they had to learn the English language. Okay? They had to be naturalized. Okay? With other groups of people, they're not encouraging naturalization. They're encouraging them to retain speaking Spanish or, or Swahili or uh, whatever. And if you uh, and and they're met if they when they apply for their government programs, they have interpreters to help them with their government programs. There is no encouragement to naturalize these people, one bit. So the descriptions and projections of racial and ethnic composition of the Ameri of the American people appear kaleidoscopic, with varied accounts and interpretations. Some commentators anticipate a new melting pot often labeled as the, quote, browning of America, uh, characterized by continued blurring of once distinct racial and ethnic divisions, uh, this interpretation is consistent with the thesis of the declining significance of race and ethnicity in American society. Others see new racial divisions arising. I see both happening simultaneously, if you want to know the truth. Uh, new racial divisions arising as some immigrant groups are allowed to integrate with an expanded and privileged... Now, this is not true. It's saying some groups are allowed to integrate with an expanded and privileged white population. What I would say is this. I would say, and I know this for a fact, I associate with all these people and I have most of my life, okay? What I would say is for the most part, uh, East Indians and people from the Indian subcontinent, Arabs, people from the Middle East, and on top of that, Asians, Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, etc., Taiwanese, whatever, they take it upon themselves to assimilate into the United States and to more or less take up understanding now, not recently, not recently they haven't, but in the generations past, especially when I was a kid, one of my best friends in elementary school was a little Indian girl from India. Uh, she had no hint of an accent. Uh, she could speak whatever the hell language, who knows what language, my guess is Hindustani at home, and English perfectly, okay? Uh, and she assimilated well and played well with other children. Uh, African-American youths, now when I was in elementary school, I also had a friend that was African-American. Uh, both he and I were hellraisers, okay? And that's the truth. Uh, I don't ever try to downplay my behavioral issues as a youth. But my point is, is other groups of people, Haitians, Africans, and African Americans choose not to be assimilated into the greater. It's a choice. It's a choice they're making. Other people are making the other choice, which is to be assimilated into these groups. So you can't say that uh, they are being kept from assimilation. Uh, or integration, as they're calling it. They're not being kept from integration. They are choosing not to integrate. They don't want to integrate. Okay? 
So the U.S. Census Bureau recently released population projections showing that non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority of the population but in 2042. Uh, I think it's going to happen a little sooner than that. Most media accounts of the forecasts neglect to report that whites, as opposed to non-Hispanic whites, are actually projected to remain a large majority, upwards of 70% in the United States until 2050, of the U.S. population. Uh, this is a, a psychotic projection in the sense that if you keep importing people, and the birth rate amongst non-Hispanic whites keeps dropping as it is on the line that it's dropping. And the death rate of non-Hispanic white Americans, as I've covered with deaths of despair, keeps going up. Uh, that's an impossibility. It doesn't make sense. The numbers wouldn't make any goddamn sense there, you know. So these projections essentially blah, blah, blah. Many Americans have multiple identities. That reflect, that reflect complex ancestral origins, tribal and communal associations, and varied ideological outlooks on race and culture in general. People do not change their ethnicities as a matter of fashion, but they may emphasize different aspects depending on circumstances. Well, I'm going to give you a hint here. My, I'm a quarter Brazilian, Okay. I'm a quarter Brazilian. My mom's family came from Brazil. Okay, my mom's mom's family came from Brazil. Maybe I'm an eighth Brazilian, whatever. Doesn't matter. I legally can refer to myself as a Hispanic. Okay? When I apply for jobs, I'm a Hispanic. When I fill out the census, I'm a Hispanic. And why am I a Hispanic? Because when you are a Hispanic, you are afforded priority over non-Hispanic whites, okay? So I think there are going to be people like me that are going to, I mean, I don't identify as a Hispanic in my everyday life, but the fact of the matter is I legally can identify as a Hispanic uh, so I do when I'm applying for a job or when I'm applying for some sort of assistance or things like that because you need to do what you need to do to get by. So, for instance, a person who identifies as a Mexican among relatives might identify as Hispanic at work, as American when overseas. A person of mixed heritage might be Native American in one context but white in another. Uh, so that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard there. <laughs> <laughs> a person of Native American heritage might be Native American in one context, but white in another. Uh, Native American is a legitimate race of people. I don't see how you can change your biology. That's a little, that's a little bizarre to me. It's funny, I just had to pause the video while I got a drink. What's humorous about that is when I was in college, my uh, my one teacher, she was a crazy person. She went by the, way, the name of Dr. Rabbi Renee Tobin. Dr. Rabbi Renee Tobin. Uh, as far as I know, she was not a doctor, nor do I believe she was a rabbi. Uh, but the thing is, uh, she was explaining, we were learning about uh, how it, uh, it was one of my... Uh, I think it was juvenile justice. She taught a couple of my classes. But what was so humorous is this kook would do things that had nothing to do with the subject matter. And again, what's funny is in college, one of my best friends was a black gentleman uh, that was that served in the, uh, the Iraq war. So I think it's absurd. I think a lot of people think that people like me are predisposed to behaviors that they're not predisposed to simply because they want to think that way. They don't, and that's one of the things. I think liberals are the most, and, and so-called conservatives that are liberals, are the most closed-minded people ever. Uh, but one of the funny things is me and him used to crack up about this woman because she was a loon, okay? 
So she supported things like transgenderism and all that. It had nothing to do with the topic. She spent three weeks of our course in juvenile justice trying to disprove Darwin's theory of evolution because it wasn't fair. According to her, it wasn't fair. Well, reality is not fair. It's reality. Okay? But what was humorous... Oh, oh, and the other one that cracked me up, she didn't believe... She believed that uh, people starving to death in the third world, in Africa, are have anorexia nervosa. Now, this is a woman that was a licensed... She actually was a licensed clinical social worker. I know that because she applied for a job at Pendel Mental Health while I was actively working at Pendel Mental Health. And what was so hilarious about that is when uh, Dr. Dr. Rabbi Renee Tobin applied for that job, yes, she was a licensed clinical social worker. She wasn't lying about that. And she actually, hand to God... Uh, believed that people starving to death in Africa suffered from anorexia nervosa, and that was their problem. But more importantly, and more to the point, <laughs> a person of mixed heritage, uh, this thing here, she was uh, telling me and the class that a gentleman had, uh, yeah, people don't know this, when you're a Native American, you can hunt and fish in any crazy way you want, and you can even hunt endangered animals and things like that. It's not as restrictive. And this woman was Native American, and her husband was, and it was in California, and they were fishing with a gill net. She got sighted, he didn't, because she was Native American, or yeah, she was Native American, so she didn't get a citation, he did. Okay, now my point was is that he was Native American by marriage. Because he was, and now people might not know this, but Native American, there's a church, the Native American Church of North America, uh, and I'm going to get into this later about Wakantanka and the peyote religion and all that jazz, uh, and what you, need to, what you need to fully grasp here is culturally and religiously, you could technically be a Native American in that sense, but not biologically. Okay, and what I and she said, you can't be a Native American. You can't change your race by getting married. So I had asked her. I said, Mrs. Tobin, Mrs. Tobin, listen here. You're a person of the Jewish persuasion, correct? And she said, yes, she was a person of the Jewish persuasion. Uh, and I said, you know, if a non-Jew converts to Judaism after marrying a Jewish person. Does that not make them a Jewish person? And she, of course, said, of course, that makes them a Jewish person. So my response was, well, are Jews a religion or a race? And she responded that they are both. They are both a religion and a race. Now, in the case that I was stating with the gentleman that was married to a Native American woman that she brought up, mind you, in a juvenile justice class to the best of my knowledge, whatever it was, she handled all of our psych classes. So there's no way in hell that this had anything to do with anything psych related. Uh, what my point is as the white gentleman married to the Native American woman that was cited for fishing with a gill net while his wife wasn't because she was a Native American and he wasn't, was obliged by marriage to observe certain Native American cultural norms. And I think that's defensible. I think you could defend that in court. After all, I was going to school for criminal justice, not, I don't know what the hell you'd call it. So, in this article, they compare different accounts of racial and ethnic composition of the American population and measure the degree of overlap of identities for the largest racial and ethnic groups. Our analysis relies on responses, blah, 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 blah. You can finish reading this on your own, but this is what is causing people to become nervous. I've already gone over deaths of despair. I want you to uh, Google Deaton and Ann Case... And uh, look up Deaths of Despair. Look, up, look it up on PubMed. See what it says. I've already covered it, but see what it says. Moving forward. So I've covered this uh, also. Two genetic studies have been upheld. I have upheld the Indo-Aryan migration from Central Asia 
into India. Now, it gets better than that. They've actually even isolated the tribe, the Chukchi, where the departure was made from the Indo-Europeans, which make up the people of India, Europe, and Iran, where the departure, the Chukchi tribe, in Siberia, I believe it was, where the departure, the genetic departure comes, where it, they became uh, Mongols, Mongoloids, such as the Koreans, Chinese, Mongolians, etc. The Indo-Europeans, the people of India, Iran, Europe, the Levant, those things, and uh, those folks, and, uh, oh, and the Mongoloid people also include, of course, Native Americans, uh, which is a branch of the Mongolian people that broke away from the Mongolians, the Siberian, you know, so that's, they crossed the land bridge, we all know that jazz. Uh, we also found out there's some Australoid DNA in Native Americans, which is pretty cool, that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, but that doesn't have to do with this. So, uh, what I'm saying is, not only was this upheld by two genetic studies, but why did the Indian media report the opposite? Well, that's because the Indian media has a nationalist government at the point, at this point, and they don't like the idea of outside influence in India. They want to promote this concept that everything in India came from India. It's just not true. Okay? So, there's a lot. So, media confusion. This talks about the media confusion. The theory of the Aryan invasion or migration was first put forward by Western scholars, blah, 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 European, Central... So, European or Central Asian Aryans swept in... Now, remember, Aryan is a Sanskrit word from the word Aryas, which means noble of blood and of birth swept into the subcontinent, displacing the indigenous people of the Indus Valley civilization. They didn't displace the indigenous people, they intermixed with them. That's different. So, and this is what you have to understand, and this is why people need to read The Cosmic Race by Jose Vasconcelos. So these Aryans were said to have introduced key elements of Indian culture. They literally are the people that brought things like Hinduism, Buddhism, the whole concept of Dharma comes from the Indo-Aryan religions, and I'm going to get into that, or from Tengrism, which gave rise to the Indo-Aryan branch of, spoken, of languages spoken all across North, West, and East India today. Now, the Indo-Aryan branch of languages is spoken all across Europe, all across, well not all across, but it's also Farsi as an Indo-Aryan language, okay? Now, then there's some Semitic languages that are not Indo-Aryan, and there are things like, believe it or not, Greek, which is weird, but it is. Uh, some of what the term, Ar like the Phoenician, the Phoenician language is, um, that's, that's a little different. That's, that's actually what's interesting. It's interesting how accurately tracing languages also trace genetics. That is actually phenomenally accurate, except in some places in Africa, but there's also a mixture of the uh, Arab languages into parts of Africa, uh, which followed the Arab slave trade. Uh, some of what the, what the term Aryan once referred to has been proved by, uh, it's not been proved to be scientifically inaccurate. It was a term, it was a Hindu term being used by anthropologists in a different way. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Academic split, these results, blah, 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 blah. American geneticists and science rise to the... This research points strongly. This is a gentleman. I'm assuming he is uh, maybe Pakistani. His name is... So he's probably a descendant of these Indo-Aryans. The Pakistanis, if you notice, a lot of Pakistanis... Uh, they're very, um, they look like they're very um, higher caste Indians, although they don't have a caste system in Pakistan. Uh, but Razib Khan did not agree. He said this research points strongly to the fact that Aryans migrated to the Indian subcontinent. Okay. But they're not the only ones. Remember, the Mughals conquered India. The Mughals were Mongols. 
So people need to understand this. The, the Vedic culture in this Valley Civilization with the culture of the... So they authored the Vedas. Okay. Two new papers, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. You can read the rest of this on your own. So Aryan migration debate, this is being solved. This may come as a surprise to many and a shock to blah, 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 because of the dominant narrative, yada, yada, yada. Okay, research is thoroughly did it. Uh, this is what this is saying the opposite, but it's not true. So this website's giving me a little bit of trouble here. As you can see, it's a bit of a stretch to say that the Aryan invasions were disproven. What is abundantly clear is that we are a multi-source civilization. This is what you need to understand about India. Now, this is what you have to understand. This is, I had a friend, a very beautiful young lady. She liked me. Uh, she was from Morocco, and she was a Berber, and she thought she was black. She wasn't black. Berbers are not black. They're a different thing. They are their own thing. They are a mixture. They're a, a completely separate thing. Uh, they are Semitic, Indo-European, and black. But they're not any of those things because those things, because what through geographic separation and, uh, and sexual selection, they have become their own race of people. They are their own race of people, and they are mostly Indo-European. But if you look at a Berber, they do not look like your typical Indo-European, okay? So the out-of-Africa immigrants and blah, 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 you can read this on your own, but the, the truth is India is a multi-source people. Uh, different castes in India, everybody in India is an Indian. They've proven that. They're all made up of the same stuff. Some of them have more of some and less of others in them, okay? And I, I strongly recognize, I, saw, I strongly suggest people learn about the genetics of India. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, of course, they're Australoid. Uh, the Dravidians were Australoid people. Uh, the Indo-Aryans, the Mongols, uh, other people like the Turks. Very interesting, very interesting groups of people. So the same liberals that are whining that race doesn't exist, race doesn't exist, race is a social construct, yada, 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 some of the more educated amongst the radical left are claiming, well, genetic, genetic tests that are testing for disease risk are racist because they're only testing, the DNA tests only work on people of European ancestry. Whites only DNA tests show how unequal science has become. The DNA testing company Color Genomics says the early year it will, uh, early next year it will offer customers a new type of gene analysis that could tell them if they are at risk of a heart attack. Here's the problem though, it only works on white people. Well, if race was not real, how could it only work on white people? If white people did not exist, remember, remember I covered um, uh, Noel Ignatiev. Noel Ignatiev stated that white people do not exist. Well, if white people do not exist as a distinct people, how the hell is there a genetic test that only works on white people? Genetics are a real thing that physically exists in space and time. It is a molecule that takes up physical space and time. So yes, white people do exist. There, I proved it. So this is about the Juchi ideology. I'm gonna skip to the core principles of the Juchi ideology, okay? So uh, let's go here, so. First, the government of the Republic will implement with all consistency the line of independence, self-sufficiency, and self-defense to consolidate 
the political independence of the country, build up more solidly the foundations of an independent national economy capable of ensuring the com and uh, the complete unification, independence, and prosperity of our nation and increasing the country's defense capabilities as so as to safeguard the security of the fatherland reliably by their own force by splendidly embodying their party's idea of Juchi in all fields. So what I want to point out here is what we need now is we need U.S. Juchi. And uh, I think that it's important that people grasp that. So political independence is a core principle of Juchi. Juchi stresses equality and mutual respect among nations. So keep that in mind. It stresses equality and mutual respect amongst nations. Okay. Juchi, uh, okay, asserting that every state has the right to self-determination. Every right, every, every state has the right to self-determination. Yielding to foreign pressure or intervention would violate the principle of political independence and threaten the country's ability to defend its sovereignty. Juchi, however, does not advocate total isolation and encourages cooperation between socialist states. As Kim Jong Il summarized in the work in his work on Juchi idea, independence is not in conflict with internationalism, but is the basis of its strengthening. Economic self-sufficiency is required to achieve political independence, according to adherents of Juchi. Now, what you have to understand, um, Juan Perón, when Juan Perón first took power in Argentina. The British owned the railways, the British owned the airports, the British owned the roads, the British owned the infrastructure. The first things that Juan Perón did was he utilized Argentina's money, which it was costly to do this, to buy back everything and make it Argentinian again, which was necessary for Argentina to be an independent, self-governing country. Okay? He also implemented the creation of hundreds of hydroelectric dams. Now, these hydroelectric dams provided power to the people of Argentina at a cost that they could afford. Okay, dig. So military self-reliance is also crucial for state maintenance. Okay, so Juchi in practice. North Korea maintained those relations with the Soviet Union and China during the Cold War, having emerged from Soviet occupation and a war which it fought alongside Chinese communists. However, North Korea also opposed what it viewed as Soviet and Chinese attempts to interfere in the post-war affairs, meaning they didn't want the Soviet Union and China telling them how to run their country. Okay, so it, it didn't take sides in the Sino-Soviet split. National survival has been as a guiding principle of North Korea's diplomatic stri uh, strategy as countries in the Eastern Bloc collapsed and introduced market reforms. North Korea increasingly emphasized Juchi in both theory and practice. After the devastation of the Korean War, North Korea began to rebuild its economy with a base in heavy industry with an aim of becoming as self-sufficient as possible. As a result, North Korea developed what has been called the most auto, auto whatever, industrial economy of, in the world. Uh, I think one of the problems with the early 20th century was everybody focused on industry, 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 not focusing enough on agriculture. Uh, we don't have enough people working in agriculture in the United States now to be sufficient. That's a problem. Okay, that's a problem. The Korean People's Army is one of the largest on Earth and has developed its own uh, nuclear weapons. It uh, blah 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 da, 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 international outreach. Kim Il Sung believed that Juchi principles could be applied around the world, and I believe they could too. Not just in Korea. North Korea has organized international seminars on Juchi since 1976. 
Regardless of the opposition forces, the, de the determination of the people and their strength and conviction are not measured by territorial dimensions, possession of advanced technology, still less opulence or riches. For those who wish to forget the lesson of history so easily and so quickly, Algeria, Vietnam, Guinea, Baswa, Mozambique, Angola, and closer to them, Zimbabwe, Nam uh, Namibia, and Azania are excellent examples which make them deeply reflect on. Okay, what we want is not the perfection of political independence alone. The evil forces craftily manipulate the economic levers in order to perpetuate their supremacy and reduce uh, other people to vassals. Related concepts, let's go over the related concepts. I suggest people learn about Juchi ideology. I think it's very interesting. I'm not going to get too into this, okay? This is called the creativity of religion. People say, uh, yeah, I had somebody saying white Juchi when, white Juchi when. Uh, the problem isn't white juchi when, the problem is we already had it, it was called the creativity religion. But people, the problem with the creativity religion, like the problem with, uh, with Adam Waffen, the problem with these things is that they embrace extremism. And extremism allows people to levy attacks against these things, and it's very hard to defend something that's saying uh, very good things like the building of community and things of that nature while saying very bad things like promoting violence okay and that's what you need to understand so the creativity religion was wonderful but you can't promote violence and at the same time promote the building of community it's going to allow people to levy haymakers at you that are very destructive and very crippling to your ability to move forward. But I do recommend, if you are interested in it, to educate yourself on the creativity of religion. So cosmotheism, this is, this is non-denominational cosmotheism, but cosmotheism is a term which refers to the idea that the entire universe, or cosmos, is God, theos, cosmos theos, uh, it is thus similar to pantheism and the idea of anima mundi, or world soul. The term was coined by uh, Lemoigue, whatever, uh, to refer to the Stoic worship of the cosmos, or mundus, as the supreme being. Jean Asman ascribed the doctrine to the ancient Egyptian theology uh, and we're going to get into that about Atonism later. Uh, ancient Egyptian theology as well as various Greek philosophies. According to Asman, uh, Malachibras could not have found a better term for what seems to be the common denominator of Egyptian religion, Alexandrian. Uh, Neoplatonic, Stoic, Hermetic, philosophy and Spinozism. Now, Spinozism, and I want to make sure people know this, Spinozism, Baruch de Spinoza was a philosopher of Portuguese Jewish origin. Uh, born in Amsterdam, the Dutch Republic, blah, 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 Benedictus de Spinoza. That's what he looks like. I'm a big fan of Spinoza. I encourage people to read his books, all of his books. He did not argue against the existence of God. He systematically proved the existence of God as the universe and systematically proved the laws of God as the laws of nature. So Norman Lowell uh, is a gentleman. He wrote a number of books. He authored uh, the book Credo, a book of very few Imperium Europa. Uh, Dionysian action and painting. This is, you might want to check out Norman Lowell. Educate yourself on him. He's a Maltese ultra nationalist. Uh, this is Mordecai Nayasu. He is an Israeli uh, chemist, I believe he was. Uh, yes, he was an Israeli political theorist and philosophical chemist. He was also a cosmotheist. Uh, he changed the name to Biodeism or I'm sorry, to cosmodeism. 
see, from cosmotheism to cosmodeism, and that was because of Dr. Pierce. So, the cosmotheistic hypothesis stipulates that the Big Bang that created the cosmos was a local event in an infinite universe, blah, 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 blah. New physics, and this is very important. Uh, I will be reading. I have not yet educated myself on his concepts. I need to. I think that he's a very interesting gentleman. Uh, from cosmotheism to cosmodeism, since several groups uh, co-opted the name cosmotheism, they didn't co-opt the name cosmotheism. Cosmotheism was a name already being used philosophically. <laughs> it was a name being used in philosophy. They didn't co-opt the name. Uh, this gentleman changed the name of it to cosmodeism. Uh, co and he entitled a book, Cosmodeism Worldview for the Space Age. Of course, Dr. William Luther Pierce here was also a cosmotheist and the creator of the Cosmotheist Community Church which was a community in Hillsboro, West Virginia. Now, I do not recommend that people, I may actually start to write down some of my ideas about uh, a peaceful religious concept as an alternative to Satanism, as an alternative to some of these crazy ideas that these people are pumping out and as an, an alternative to Christianity. I am like Pierre Teilhard de Chardin in the sense that what I believe, like Chardin believed, was, um, you know, Christianity would eventually evolve into a post-Christian religion and man would evolve into a God-man. Uh, pantheism is the philosophical religious belief that reality, the universe, and the cosmos are identical to divinity and the supreme being or entity. Okay, so external links, uh, pantheism.net should be on here, and I strongly encourage people to check out pantheism.net. Of course, Baruch Spinoza in his book Ethics, you know, was a pantheistic stance. Uh, different people have been pantheistic. Okay, omnism is not pantheism. A lot of people confuse the two. Omnism is the belief that all gods are legit. So, Atonism was the religion of, Ak of Akhenaten. Now, what I want people to understand, King Tutankhamun shares genes with half of Europe's male population. Keep that in mind when you watch Jada Pinkett Smith's movie. So, Atonism, Aten religion, the Amara religion, the Amara heresy, was a religion in ancient Egypt. It was founded by Akhenaten, the, a pharaoh who ruled the New Kingdom uh, under the, eighth, the 18th dynasty. The religion is described as monotheistic or monolaratristic. Now, the concept is that Aten, the sun disk, is the ultimate god. Now, whether Aten was the physical sun or something beyond the physical sun, like the physical sun, the rays of the sun, the life-giving essence of the sun, the life energy, the ka of the sun. Uh, they don't fully know, because unfortunately, his his, uh, the people that came after him tried to erase him, and tried to erase, and tried to erase Atonism from history. It's very interesting, very interesting religion. Um, as you can see here, they tried to remove him. Uh, but the concept is similar. Uh, what you have to understand is there's Aten, and then there's the Nataru. The Nataru are the Egyptian gods that we're familiar with through their Greek names like Osiris, Ra, uh, Set, Isis, Sekhmet, uh, Baset, etc. All these deities are the Nataru, they're nature spirits. And Aten is the supreme deity, the a pantheistic interpretation of God. So, uh, this is uh, Aten, the solar deity's powerful reign. Introduction, ancient Egypt is known for its impressive architecture, advanced mathematics, intricate hieroglyphics, blah, blah, blah. One of the most intriguing aspects of this ancient civilization is its religion and mythology. Religion played a significant role in Egyptian society, shaping not only their beliefs about the afterlife, but also their daily lives. Egyptian religion, particularly Atonism, seems to have played a big role in Abramism, 
Okay, and that's going to be coming in interesting later when I cover that. Introducing Atten as a lesser known god with a unique backstory, blah, blah, blah. Origin story created by Pharaoh Akhenaten. In ancient Egyptian mythology, many gods played important roles in different aspects of life. However, Aten was a unique god who came into existence during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten. It is believed that Aten was created by Akhenaten as a new god to be worshipped. Akhenaten was a heretical pharaoh. Uh, who sought to change the religious beliefs and practices of Egypt. He believed that there was only one true God and that this God was, was represented by the sun disk. Thus, he created the Aten as the personification of this deity. So remember, this is not unlike Rome in a sense. I believe where he was going with this, Rome adopted Christianity under the pretext of one God, one emperor, one Rome, one empire, one world. You dig? And I think that's what Pharaoh Akhenaten was attempting to do. But there is such a deeper belief here. A unique god represented as a sun disk with rays ending in hands. The Aten was different from other gods in several ways. It was not anthropomorphic. Okay, so like a pantheist, like our pantheistic interpretation, God is not anthropomorphic. This unique depiction of Aten symbolizing the power and beneficence associated with the sun's energy. Additionally, unlike other gods whose worship was confined to temples, uh, they opened in the they were in the open air. Uh, daily offerings to Aten. Aten worship involved daily offerings and prayers at sunrise and sunset. The people believed that these offerings would please the god. Okay. Each day, Agnaten himself led the morning and evening rituals. So, uh, this included hymns of praise to Aten. The temple priests played a crucial role in ensuring that the daily rituals were performed correctly. They were responsible for maintaining the temple complex, organizing festivals in honor of Aten, and reminding people of their religious duties. They believed that their work was essential to keep Aten happy. Akhenaten's monotheistic beliefs. Akhenaten believed that Aten was not only a powerful god, but also the one true god above all other gods. He sought to eliminate all other gods from worship except for Aten. This trend is known as Atenism. Akhenaten's monotheistic beliefs were so strong that he moved the capital city from Thebes to Amarna. Aten's worship declined rapidly after Akhenaten's death as his successors attempted to undo his religious reforms and reinstate traditional Egyptian worship. However, historians have since revived interest in Atenism. The controversial decline, blah, 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 rejection of Aten by traditionalists, the decline of worship. You can get into this. This is going through the downfall. When we come back, I'm going to discuss the Mongolian slash uh, Central Asian slash Turkic religion of Tengrism. Tengrism is an ancient religion practiced in Central Asia. And I'm going to dig very deeply into the Tengrist beliefs when we come back.